capítulo nacional, é gratuito, tem vários benefícios. Dentro da sacola tem um, um folhetinho igual a esse, tem um QR Code atrás, enfim, tem todas as informações. E falar para vocês que estamos transmissão ao vivo no YouTube, em português e em inglês, porque estamos compartilhando com 35 capítulos nacionais de Isaac. Muito obrigado a todos vocês que estão nos assistindo e peço a todos que compartilhem é, Espírito Climais dentro do YouTube. Tá bom? At me to come to Cyprus you and to uh, come to free mind uh, my special thanks to Paolo Martelli and I am going to talk about prevention in work environments uh, some aspects that were mentioned in the previous panel were very interesting. There are two or three things that are common denominators that are present in the different panels. Uh, I would like to make reference to Dr. Bertolotti. It was a pleasure to hear him in Buenos Aires. We always use him as a reference. And we've learned a lot about um, communicative and communication, community oriented initiatives. Uh, Argentina has always focused a lot on psychoanalysis and the entrance from Brazil is quite uh, broadening. So the first thing that I would like to talk about is uh, about uh, what we do, about what we do. As Paulo mentioned, I am the head of the ISIP Argentinian chapter. I coordinate a space called uh, Forum Vitae. It is a space that is inside of a um, medical center and it has to do with uh, trains in Argentina. Uh, it's, it belongs to social work uh, and we have uh, about 40,000 people working for us. And one of the things that we address is a uh, mental health. So this space has all has been dedicating a lot of focus to prevention and as we generate, we create, we establish um, partnerships with uh, UNESCO, ISUB, and we publish uh, article, scientific articles and lecture in congresses. And why do we work with prevention? Because uh, it's um, mm, much of what reach us are t issues, uh, uh, medical problems that could have been addressed before. For example, when we talk about cardiovascular disease, um, th there was a lot of focus on cardiovascular diseases and we launched a specific project and uh, we had a um, significant reduction in the number of um, strokes so and all of the um, subsequent and side 
effects. And the second topic that caught our attention due to the high number of uh, uh, cases was the was substance abuse. And we started to design a prevention program 10 years ago. We started working 10 years ago. So we Bartolotti said three things that uh, were very important to me. He uh, mentioned Durheim, the, uh, the sociologist. Uh, he mentioned that suicide is a collective problem. Another very interesting thing that he mentioned was how we evaluate, how we assess uh, the efficiency of programs. Some programs would highly have high impacts and others sometimes negative impacts. And the other aspect that he mentioned that was really interesting as well is uh, that the programs have to be uh, designs from bottom from an a bottom up perspective. And this uh, fully relates with um, addiction problems. So in order to design our uh, program, we sat down with the workers. We uh, tried to understand their culture, their logic, and the work culture in um, their work environment. So we gathered quantitative as well as qualitative data. So um, the workers, they participated intensely in the design of the program. So what do we mean when we talk about participation? Everybody is always saying all programs have, have to be participative and they have to have the help of com uh, com the engagement of communities. But there are many different levels of what participation in programs mean. Uh, we, can, uh, we cannot expect consensus. Uh, all the time. Uh, it is very important to have people participating in the design of programs because it increases engage engagement. So we engaged in trying to understand what was going on in the, in the work environment. Another central aspect of our of the design of the project was the political sphere. We uh, established partnership with the unions, with the government and the company. So it we created a strong network to develop the program and this is uh, central to ensure the sustainability uh, to ensure that the program will be supported so we established uh, strategic alliances and partnerships and in the past year we had um, central support uh, to preventive chapters of ISUP Latin America yes, and we had uh, support in Argentina as well. We work with about 8,000 people in 16 Argentinian provinces and our reach is huge. So let me tell you a bit more about the results we have achieved. An important topic is a why why carry out prevention initiatives in workplaces it's essential a workplace is fundamental for everyone isn't it we spend a lot of time in our workplaces that's true for pretty much everyone and in addition to that 
working and, and, and labor is about building our identity from a subjective point of view because that's where we recognize ourselves. We recognize ourselves according to the work we do, the career we pursue. Um, I am my name, my last name, but I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor. So um, what we do as a job also helps us build ourselves as a person, as an individual, and in our relationship with the others. It's formative. Our workplace is a place that can enable this type of intervention because it's essential in the very building of our identity. So because of the long time we spend in our workplaces, they are special places for the design of prevention programs. And fundamentally, um, uh, we have to include the topic of substance abuse, substance use and abuse. So, like um, some t a, a, a doctor mentioned a Durkheim a, a, a session ago, and um, he's a philosopher from the last century, and we also considered here something that was being done in Italian associations in the late 60s. Unions, Italian unions, played a very important role and especially when it came to improving the health of workers. It's what we call the Italian model. And there are actually many movies about this time. It's the Italian opera, uh, uh, the Italian workers model. There's a film, there's a movie called La Clase Obrera al Paraíso. It's, uh, it, it kind of shows the leading role that workers have to play in some um, in their own contexts the model i propose is that we cannot offer prevention in health without considering the knowledge of workers we have to include their own knowledge because if i'm a health expert and i want to create a prevention program i cannot just simply propose a program without addressing and including the everyday knowledge of the workers themselves. We cannot disregard or rule out their own knowledge. You cannot think of a program for rail railroad workers if I do not take into account their knowledge, their expertise, because they're there every day for years. So they know that better than anyone else. They know the practical conditions of their work and the hardships, the challenges that I'm not familiar with. So that's why uh, the programs should be bottom up. They should include this knowledge, this wisdom. If they do not, they will probably go wrong at some point. There is an interesting anecdote about uh, that. Sometimes programs uh, fail to consider that, and that's why they fail in the end. An interesting opportunity in the in the late 80s in Buenos Aires, I was working with prevention programs in workplace in, with the seaport workers in Buenos Aires, and then from a, uh, we decided to carry out a prevention program in workplaces. It was a governmental initiative, and basically the program had the following motto: "Alcohol harms your health." There were many billboards. Um, bills, posts around the seaport saying that alcohol is bad for your health. And then um, some university students decided to assess the program. They evaluated the program and the evaluations uh, would tell us whether or not the program was working. And, um, and see what happened with the evaluation at this point. They were working with, as, and, and as we worked with uh, seaport workers, we started to see how it happened with um, workers at the seaport. And they lined up to carry heavy bags, and they, the longshoremen, and they passed bags of cereals from one to the other. Long lines were made to, uh, lines, they lined up spontaneously early in the morning, longshoremen the dockers, port workers, and those who carried more bags uh, were rewarded. Those who worked more hours also 
were rewarded, but two things got our attention. The lines were formed spontaneously, and workers didn't want to line up with workers who didn't drink alcohol. Those who didn't drink alcohol could not line up with the others. And then we started to investigate, and we found out that workers who drank alcohol had a better reputation as strong men, and those who didn't drink alcohol were seen as weak, but those who drink al drank alcohol were tough. Men of the people, they were rude, they were actual dockers who could stand more hours than normal, who could work for more hours than regular ordinary men. And then we started to work, and then how did they receive the message, like, alcohol is bad for you? Well, it's bad for me, it's bad for my health. That's uh, bullshit, that nothing happens to me. I drink alcohol every day and I'm tough. Look at me, I'm strong, I'm sturdy, I work. I carry heavy bags of wheat, right, so, of cereal. So, I, I like this example. It's back from the 90s, many years have passed, much water under the bridge. Things have changed, things have evolved, but it's a good example that uh, things may not really work in some contexts. Our intentions were good, we spent money, it was a, the boards, the billboards, the posters were beautiful, but the results were negative because it, it, the campaign didn't engage anyone. Actually, the results were, were, were negative. Right, the situation was worse than before because uh, they were mocking each other after the after the billboards, you know. So I just told this anecdote to highlight the importance of research, qualitative research, quantitative research, engaging workers. We have to start this type of strategy bottom up. We have to engage them, and we have to understand the context and the culture for any type of intervention that we're planning. We. Um, uh, we talked about the Italian uh, workforce uh, model and um, the Italian workers labor model for um, and and where the key is recognizing the workers awareness the workers expertise and knowledge of their own places if you don't know that if you don't if you don't consider that you're jeopardizing your entire work your entire initiative in our case we started working in this case in particular we started working with railroad workers and um, we started working with them and in Argentina they have this it's a job that passes down from generation to generation. You talk to the people there, to railway railway workers, and they say, my father used to work here, my grandfather used to work here. So it's a family thing. It's a family tradition of working in railroads. And there's also a very interesting cultural component uh, there. They call themselves a family. It's the railroad family. It's a very strong network. They very they're very closely um, knit, and um, it's one of the things that we have to consider when we work with them. Again, the fact that they are um, it, they're again a, a close knit community of workers that that have known each other for generations. It's really a family. It's uh, the railroad family. It's um, this close-knit network where um, it, it, it's even hard to penetrate sometimes. So to work with them, first we carry out some research and then we identify some topics that can be addressed. We identify their strengths and uh, we base on our interventions on their strengths sometimes. We did this uh, research work, and I think that today other sessions talked about this before. It's the importance of evidence-based approaches, right? The importance of evidence, but sometimes it's just applesauce and we just talk about evidence, but we don't really put it into practice. So what exactly do we mean by evidence? right what exactly do we mean by evidence or evidence-based and impact assessment so and what we noticed in this project 
and I will continue to talk about the previous discussion, the previous session, because it was amazing. Suicidal suicides are social phenomena. They are directly related to the context. The topic of suicide is not only an individual decision. It goes far beyond that. There's a lot at play when someone kills themselves. And the same happens in workplaces, right? So these are complex settings. And when we think about them, we have to understand that we cannot do things alone. We need institutional partnerships and we have to include different expertises, different types of knowledge, including the knowledge of the workers we're working with, their uh, practical knowledge, their social knowledge, their knowledge about their own community. It's fundamental. That's essential for us to devise strategies that will work for them. So uh, we, we, in this particular project with the railroad workers, we, we did this first research to, to determine the profile of those people, of the workers we were uh, working with, and uh, that's when we identified the networks, the internal connections, the internal relationships, and then we identified some leaders in there. We also came up with some some tools that uh, especially aimed at early prevention, because we noticed that in many workplaces, the first to have uh, contact with, with 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 problems in the workplace were precisely those leaders, because there was a lot of trust among them, strong bonds, like a family, like they call themselves a family. So for us, we identified the spontaneous internal network, the leaders, their relationships, and we tapped into that. We tried to strengthen those networks. We, we tapped into those networks to work with early prevention. And um, the first thing we did was to try and raise awareness about problems that were then seen as natural. So, for example, it was natural to binge drink in some situations. So workers were there always uh, in the same places. They already have uh, harsh working conditions, sometimes in the countryside and the back of beyond. And then they would stop at noon to have lunch and they would start drinking then. And that was also related to workplace accidents that would happen after lunch. And that um, that was normal, that was natural, that was seen as natural. Abuse, violent relationships, that was all seen as natural. And that was all, to some extent, driven by alcohol, excess alcohol consumption. And um, if it's abusive, if it's more than 70 grams of alcohol a day per for, for an adult, this varies according to the type of drink. Beer is one thing, spirits are something different, but then when you get, get to this amount of alcohol, we consider it to be abusive. And then, uh, when we actually started to pay attention to that, they would drink abusively. They would sometimes binge drink during their lunch hours, and then, of course, it would put them at danger because they operate heavy machinery, they carry heavy weights, and uh, also railroads are very important for the whole economy of the country. Um, controls have become stricter over the years. Today, there's more control over uh, the drivers, the operators. There was a terrible accident a couple of decades ago, and the person in charge of the train was drunk. So these are um, work contexts where abu alcohol abuse is a problem. And actually, if you're a trained driver, it's not that abusive alcohol consumption is a problem. Any alcohol is a problem if you're a trained driver or if you're operating heavy machinery, right? Or who would jump on a plane knowing that the pilot has uh, drunk whiskey before flying? Are you okay with that? Would you fly like at ease? Would you be at ease? No, I'm sure you would not. No amount is acceptable depending on the job you do, 
right? And there is a, there, there are many situations where we expect. Uh, it's not that we do not expect abusive alcohol consumption, but we expect no alcohol consumption at all. Think of a surgeon, a surgeon who's going who's going to operate on you. You know, you expect him to drink to 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 not drink. Uh, anything before the surgery, right? So in some situations, actually in many situations, consum con alcohol consumption should be zero. So we started uh, with this awareness raising, awareness raising campaign, but we started saying that that what was natural for them was already excessive, was already abusive. And then we started saying that for some situations, no alcohol could be accepted. But that took time. And then when we saw some problems in advance, because actually they didn't see alcohol abuse as a problem. When they realized alcohol abuse was a problem, they started saying, oh, I know, I know someone who actually has a problem. So we started to empower them and give them tools so that they could know what to do. Like we gave them addresses of medical clinics or AA groups, you know, support groups. We gave them tools so that they could also take action when they found someone in in vulnerable situations abusing drugs abusing alcohol with that we um and then after that we started this follow-up to measure the results and that's another important component of everything because when we talk about evidence we talk about measuring assessing what was done evaluating things seeing what we did right seeing what they did what we did wrong and find room for improvement the first results we reaped were uh, the first chart shows the usefulness of the the program or their interest in the program and actually thinking of these uh, aspects here they um, they would highly appreciate uh, training workshops they they highly appreciated they highly valued training workshops they found training workshops interesting useful even fun they said i never thought about that that was new to them and that's why uh, they said i never thought about this am i doing this wrong so at some point there was this interest in our training sessions they could apply that to their personal lives to their households they learned, they felt empowered to take better care of themselves, of their families, in addition to their work. So the training programs were, were very, were highly valued by the railroad, railroad workers. This was the context. 57% of the participating workers considered that their that they could consume alcohol during work hours at work. So again, it was natural. Alcohol consumption in workplaces was absolutely absolutely natural. And they were not aware of the relationship between um, accidents and alcohol consumption, accidents and no-show or, you know, Over the past 10 years, and then in the past 10 years, there's uh, over the past 10 years, there's been a decrease in the number of acute interventions there related to excess alcohol and drug consumption. But there's been an increase in early interventions and outpatient interventions. So there's been a progressive decline over the years, a gradual decline over the years. And when we started having early interventions, it was no longer like a, a very severe cases. It was like primary care, primary assistance, secondary assistance sometimes. But uh, and, and then companies became interested in that because companies finally realized that on the one hand, they would strengthen the network between their workers. And on the other hand, they would save money. They would actually save money. They would save money with health insurance, with absenteeism, um, work accidents, 
think like that. And that's important because we need partnerships, right? We need partnerships between stakeholders, organizations, partnerships between organizations, government agencies, international agencies. So it's important that for the companies, it's important that companies see results. It's important that they understand that this helps them save money at the end of the day. As for a uh, basic um, concept of abuse and addiction, dependency, we also worked on that. We talked to them about risk factors. We an analyzed the most common risk factors. We addressed that. The programs focused on that were also well rated. The um, We shared a lot of content about this and they actually liked it. And again, the content we produced was uh, based on the research we did with them. And a lot of that content was determined and, 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 and created based on, on their help, on their support. We spoke to their representatives to create this material. It's available online from Vitae, from Vitae. Dot com. There you can find all our handbooks, our manuals for early intervention, a lot of content produced together with the workers. There's the PowerPoint presentations. It's all there. It's in Spanish, yes, but I'm sure you can understand it. And then uh, there's productivity it, at the workplace to, inc uh, to, to, to help your your co-workers and how to help your co-workers in vulnerable situations and finally coming to an end in this past year when i told you we were working together with cicade in this um, evidence-based prevention program including uh, many isap chapters in our region we also carried out another project. It was a survey where we could learn the following. We measured the impact of these initiatives over the last years, and um, we found some these um, they they they're, they they like the program. The ratings are positive. They think the program the program is useful. But then when we assessed changes in social representa representation, it was positive, but um, not significant. Right. Uh, so uh, we we were not timely enough. Meaning that if we really want to change some social aspects, we take we, it takes time, it takes processes. It's not something that you can do in a year or even two years. It takes years because these topics require a change of heart, a change of mindset. You cannot change this overnight. And that's why it's important to maintain this kind of program. They need to be sustained and sustainable. And that's why we need strong political partnerships so that these prog programs are not interrupted out of the blue. That's why we have to partner with uh, the institutions, with all the stakeholders to make sure these programs last over time. Because without that, we will never be able to drive change where we have to drive change, which is in the social representation and their perception of risk, their behaviors, their mindset. So um, ultimately, these are the aspects that we want to change. In the last work we did with CICADIS support and experts from the University of Miami, we saw some change. There were some changes, but they were not statistically significant. And then, well, and that's when evidence can play a role and help inform our next steps. That's when our, uh, measuring is important, and 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 that uh, because without evidence you don't know where you got it wrong and 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 where you're spending your money where you're spending your time and, and I'm, I'm not only talking about money and time but i'm talking about energy and effort right all the work we do when we carry out a project so this is something i wanted to highlight and leave you with today um in this case we realize that 
that we have to work with prevention and care, that there was an impact on personal lives, family lives, community lives. We collected this uh, data from their own testimonials, from their reports. They said, this was useful for me, this helped me, or I could help a colleague, or we, we could help a colleague. This raised our awareness. We, we, we knew how to identify problems, problematic situations, and also there was a change in the context of, of the company itself. So uh, things that were seen as uh, cause for 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 dismissal were 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 now seen differently and uh, it's really a collective process another important aspect was this training program we had with health agents training to train leaders in workplaces so we trained the leaders and then each leader had an influence over a group of 20, 30 workers, and they were in charge of their areas, of their departments. Also, uh, those who could, uh, those who were ident identified as as opinion leaders in their workplaces. Another important conclusion we came to is that there was a significant impact on their health in general. There was also a significant decrease in no-show rates and um, also in the number of, of, of accidents. Uh, and there, were, there was also an increase in primary intervention. So we received more appointments or we had more appointments with people who were not in the, who, do, who did not need to be hospitalized or even they they did not even uh, they didn't need like hospital treatment then and um, uh, we could work with primary care prevention out in in outpatient settings so and most importantly the company also changed it changed its approach and started to support us more and trust what we did and uh, with that, we also achieved, we got this buy-in from, from, from the company leaders, people who would go on a leave and go back to work very um, much more quickly than before. So the productivity increased, the company was very satisfied, the workers were also satisfied. We've been working with them for about uh, 10 years. We have this partnership with universities specialized agency um, agencies government agencies and uh, i believe that when we show them evidence and when we show them the results the outcomes this enables us to keep up the good work and to keep doing what we're doing to continue to train people to prepare people to raise awareness and this is what i mean by making it sustainable over time because temporary changes are nothing but temporary changes. If we want long-lasting change, we have to make sustainable programs over time. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to open for questions. If you have any questions or comments, thank you very much for listening to me and to my experience. Guys, any questions for Roberto? We will give him a headset. If you have questions, we can translate the questions into Spanish for him. So, Roberto, I think we have no preguntas for you. Thank you so very much for your session. That was very interesting. I learned a lot, so thank you. And this is the end of another day. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for your presence, your kindness. Tomorrow we have another busy day, so make sure you get some rest and see ya.